Hi and welcome to the Sabbath School lesson for June 29, 2013. We are halfway through the year. And what an appropriate lesson to consider in the middle of the year. The lesson title, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. All the way through, even in the middle of the year, we need to remember that Christ is first and last. And as we reflect on this lesson, we look at this lesson, study this lesson, we see the importance, why it is that Jesus needs to be first and last and best in everything. Look in question two. The note under question two says, Why don't you have the quickening influence of the Spirit of God when the love of Jesus and his salvation are presented to you? It is because you do not see that Christ is first and last and best and the Alpha and the, and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the very author and finisher of our faith. You do not realize this and therefore you remain in your sins. So what this, this statement is communicating to us is that unless Christ is first and last and best in my life, I cannot be saved. I will remain in my sins. The, the quotation continues. Why is this? It is because Satan is here wrestling and battling for the souls of men. He casts his hellish shadow right athwart our pathway and all you can see is the enemy and his power. So this is communicating of discouragement, why we get into discouragement, why we see negativities around us. Why is it? Because Christ is not first and last and best in our life, in our thinking, in our thoughts. Notice the text in question to Malachi. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before them, before him. For them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. In our walk in this life, it is very easy to get discouraged with the hellish shadow of Satan through discouragement, through seeing how many things I have to overcome or seeing difficulties in people around me or seeing difficulties in the church or seeing difficulties in, in work or in whatever it is, in relationships. All this, we can get discouraged. But this discouragement comes because we're focusing on the negativity. And if we're focusing on the negativity, is Christ first and last and best in everything? That's a good question. Question 3 gives us a beautiful text in Galatians 2.20. What sort of life are we to live? Our life is to... We are to live the life of Jesus Christ. As it said there, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm living. I'm, I'm alive. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. When you view the life of Christ, you think, how did Christ keep the focus of the Heavenly Father before him, first and last in everything? In, indeed, he did. You look at his life when he had apparent discouragements. He always referred to the power of his father. For instance, when he, he got a glimpse of, of Satan falling from heaven like lightning and, and he could see the victory through all the negativities around him. He could see the victory. And it says in Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about Christ. And it says that looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross so when he went through the cross when he went through his trials and sufferings what was his focus it was the joy set before him this is what it means for christ to be first last and best in everything the beginning of my day is to be about christ and he him incorporated in what i'm doing in the middle of the day still the same and at the end of the day christ is to be the first, the last, and the best in everything. Notice the question, note under question three. And I've really got a blessing from this. When his words of instruction have been received and have taken possession of us, Jesus is to us an abiding presence, 
controlling our thoughts and ideas and actions. Can you see how practical it is for Christ to be first and last and best in everything? When we take hold of his words and, and allow the Holy Spirit to take his words, his thoughts, his mind and, ha- and take possession of us. You think, wow, that's a strong word, this word possession. We know of devil possession. What does that mean? It's where devils take hold of people and make them think a certain way and act a certain way and they get possessed from the evil spirits. Well, on the positive side, the Holy Spirit can take possession of us, except the manifestation of that is nothing like devil possession at all. In fact, it's, it's a sound mind it's, and it's a pure life. It's holy living. And our, he controls our thoughts and our ideas and actions. Continues, it says, We are imbued with the instruction of the greatest teacher the world ever knew. A sense of human accountability and of human influence give character to our views of life and of daily duties. See, you, we can bring Christ right into the daily duties of our life. And we have to. We need to. It's our privilege to. And the next statement tells us how when this happens, our outlook in every aspect of our life, when we view negatives, when we view difficulties, when we view trials, this will colour the way we see it. It says it in question, the, the second paragraph under question three. Jesus Christ is everything to us. The first, the last, the best in everything. Jesus Christ, his spirit, his character, colors everything. So we can see the source of, of joy in our life when he colors everything. What's a life without color? It, it, it's just drab. But when there's beautiful color and vibrance, it really makes a difference. When you look at a picture, a black and white photo compared to a beautiful, colorful photo, the difference is the difference between having Christ first and last and best in everything and having our human thinking and, and the mind of the evil one in how we view things. It's all bleak and rubbishing. Same picture, one has colour, one doesn't. His character, his spirit, Christ colours everything. It is the warp and woof, like a garment. The, when it's weaved, the one weave is crossed over with the other weave. One is the warp and one is the woof in a garment. So every fabric, every weaving of my life, every aspect of our life is to be, is to be interwoven with Christ's principles, Christ as our personal guide, Christ as our personal saviour, someone who is my close friend, like Enoch. Enoch walked with God for 300 years and then God took him. That, that is a life that has Christ woven through it. It is the warp, the woof, the very texture of our entire being. Coming back to that text in Galatians. I live, yet not I. Who lives? Christ lives in me. So whose life is it? It's Christ's life. It has all the texture of Jesus Christ. The words of Christ are spirit and life. We cannot then center our thoughts upon self. It is no more we that live, but Christ that liveth in us. And he is the hope of glory. Self is dead, but Christ is a living saviour. Continuing to look unto Jesus, we reflect his image to all around us. We cannot stop to consider our disappointments or even talk of them for a more pleasant picture attracts our sight. The precious love of Jesus. He dwells in us by the word of truth. Is this true in your experience? Does Jesus make you happy? Everything else may disappoint you, but does Jesus make you happy? Because if he does, then you can have the comfort that he is the first, the best in everything. Because do humans let you down? Do humans disappoint you? Yes, they do. And so we look at the application of this in question five. Christ in the home. Home relations. Here the text in Ephesians gives us a few uh, relationships. Husband to wife, 
parents to children and so on. What happens if Christ isn't the first, the last and the best in everything in human relations? Have you ever been disappointed by your spouse? Have you ever been disappointed from your parents or your friends? Have you, have you been let down by in, in human relationships? What do you do when, when, when a human lets you down? Where's the source of comfort? It's so common for young people to, to be let down by their parents. And they, have, they carry an a inner disappointment from their parents. And then they mingle with the other young people and they think they find somebody who finally loves them. And they fall in love. And they throw themselves into a relationship to such a degree that if that person wasn't there, they couldn't live. Or they just couldn't cope. If that person cheated against them or, or let them down or, or disappointed them, then they, they are absolutely shattered. Is that a life that has Christ first and best, first and last and best in everything? Not at all. And it's actually a recipe for disaster because think of this when you enter into your relationship with another human being you're you're essentially entering into a relationship with another sinner and can you trust sinners <laughs> not at all human promises are like ropes of sand so the challenge of this lesson is that is christ in your home in your human relationships is he first and last and best in everything? This is what the note says in question five. It says here, Affection may be as clear as crystal and beauteous, uh, beauteous in its purity, yet it may be shallow because it has not been tested and tried. So when we have relationships, they, we like them when they're going well. And when they're going well, we... We can share our love. We can say, I love that person. We can do things for that person because they're doing things for us, really. They're, they're loving us. They're, they're, making, they're, they're feeding our desires that, that are inbuilt for relationships. And so therefore, we're happy to, to exchange and, and have this uh, mutual um, giving. But when the test comes, when the trials come, then we withhold the things we were doing for them because they withheld theirs from us and... It's a, it's a recipe for disaster. Make Christ, it says in the, in the note, make Christ first and last and best in everything. Constantly behold Him and your love for Him will daily become deeper and stronger as it is submitted to the test and trial. The time that Christ is, is, to, is, is to be the best and la first and last and best in everything is is really revealed or become, becomes manifest in our trials, whether he really is or not. And if he is, as your love for him increases, what will happen in relationships? Your love for each other will grow deeper and stronger. Why is that? Because when Christ is interwoven in my life and I start living the life of Christ, then my love is purged from selfishness. In other words, I love despite what other people do. Human love can't do that. Human love only loves because they loved. And it's, it's like when young people fall in love. It's called, um, when, when people get infatuated, really it's, a, it's falling in love for what they do for me. And I'm happy to return that back while ever they're giving it to me. Because it keeps the stream going. But if they hate me, that's a totally different thing. But the love of Christ is loving your enemies. Loving those that despitefully use you and persecute you. The love of Christ doesn't make you a doormat where you can st just stay in an abusive relationship where you just get beaten and just don't say anything about it or do anything about it. The, if, if we're persecuted in one place, you can leave to go to another place, the Bible says. But actually the love for that person comes from Christ. It's Christ-generated. And so our love for humanity 
even our enemies, which sometimes are often our own spouse or people that are related to us, some of the bitterest fightings are within the home. But Christ is to, to bring us this love and this is what it means for him to be first and last and best in everything. And then when it comes into education, Christ gives purpose to actually what I accomplish. Even my, my education, my, when I am seeking employment or whatever aspect it is in my, in my financial life or career life, Christ is to be interwoven in it. If he's not, it essentially becomes useless. Notice the note under question six. I really like this one. In the presence of such a teacher, with such opportunity for divine education, what worse than folly is it to seek an education apart from him? To seek to be wise apart from wisdom. <laughs> That's as, that is what it is to seek education without Christ, is to seek to be wise but not wanting wisdom. It's to be true while rejecting truth. To seek illumination apart from the light. I, I want illumination, but I don't want the light. That's, that, is, that is any object of pursuit without Christ. That's what it is. It's seeking happiness. It's seeking to be happy without happiness. Because happiness can only actually come from Christ. If I enter into a relationship for the purpose of happiness, I'm actually missing the point. I enter into a relationship for the purpose of holiness, and in my pursuit of holiness, I get happiness. But if I pursue something for the purpose of happiness, then I may be let down, I may be disappointed, and I probably will be disappointed because this world is like a broken cistern, and that's exactly what the note says straight after. It's to seek illumination apart from the light and existence without the life, to turn from the fountain of living waters and to hew out broken cisterns that can hold no water. Think of it. Does Christ have to be first, last and best in everything in my life? He does for me to have salvation and for me to give purpose to anything I do, whether it be relationships or employment or education Christ gives purpose to it all. And then when it comes to missionary work, actually before we talk about missionary work, let's look at question one. Because Christ is to be the first and the last in my spiritual experience. First, by way of repentance. Can I repent without Christ? Can I repent without Christ? Well, in question, in question one, in the second note, halfway through, it says, unless... We accept divine aid. We cannot take the first step, steps toward the Savior. So in my spiritual experience, well, my education, my relationships, my career, Christ has to be best, first and last and best in everything. But when it comes to my spirituality, even the first steps of seeking after God have to come from Him. Repentance has to come from Him. Unless we accept divine aid, we cannot take the first steps toward the Saviour. And so it says, man's efforts alone are nothing but worthless. And then it continues, of ourselves we have no power to repent of sin. So my, the beginning of my spiritual walk even comes from him. The Bible also says in another place in Romans chapter 3, there are none that seek after God. My pursuit after God actually comes from his working, from his grace. But in question 1 it says, But let no man present the idea that man has little or nothing to do with the great work of overcoming. For God does, n does nothing for man without his cooperation. So, while ever Christ is to be first, last and best in everything, it still needs my, my effort to incorporate that in my choices and my decisions that only I can make. God gave me free will. Then it says, Neither say that after you have done all you can on your part, Jesus will help you. Have you ever heard the saying, do your best and Jesus will do the rest? Well, if that 
is carried through, then is Christ really first? Where you do the first 50% and Christ does the last 50%. Then you're first and his last. Now Christ, Christ is to be the first and the last and you are to cooperate with him all the way. And that's what it says here. Christ has said, without me, you can do nothing. From first to last, man is to be laborer, is to be a laborer together with God. And so right from my first experiences, I need to walk with the Lord through repentance, through acceptance, through confession, right through to missionary work. He is still to be in that position where it's actually about Christ. And let's look at question six where it to, uh, seven rather where it talks about this that christ is to be the center the apostle paul in first corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2 says for i determine not to know anything among you save jesus christ and him crucified here paul is at is communicating to the church in corinth and paul had actually employed a few different methods of ministry one of the methods he employed was when he was in Athens, which wasn't far away from Corinth. He was in Athens and he was at Mars Hill and he was speaking, trying to witness to the Greeks. And he decided to employ a f philosophy way of approach to the gospel. But it didn't really actually work very well. And in fact, Ellen White says that it wasn't the best of tactics. And so when Paul came to Corinth, he's, he's determined... Only to, only to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. To the, Jew, to the Greeks, it was a stumbling block. It was foolishness, sorry. And to the Jews, it was a stumbling block, as it says in the next text. So Paul's methodology in missionary work was strictly held to Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his determination. He didn't want to use the, the philosophy of the world and, and all the typical methods that people use to create... To, to attract a congregation, to use um, pomp and, and show, outward show, and all these methods that the world uses. Uh, the Apostle Paul didn't want to use them. He wanted to present Christ. And if Christ can't draw people, well, he will. But if people won't come and submit to Christ, then if they submit to anything else, it's useless. So forget it. Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ ascended into the heavens, Christ coming again should so soften, glad and fill the minds of the minister that he will present these truths to the people in love and deep earnestness. The minister then the minister will then be lost sight of and Jesus will be made manifest. This is what the Apostle Paul did. And the ministry, the minister is to be lost sight of. In other words, the work is taking individuals and putting their hand directly into the hand of Jesus Christ. So there's no one in between. No organization, no church, no, no nothing to cramp the mind between them and Christ for their salvation. Yes, fellowship is proper. Church order is good for missionary work. But the work is to bring people's attention to the loyalty to Jesus Christ. Service to him. As it says in another part in the um, Sabbath school lesson where it talks in question four about doing heart service as unto the Lord. This is so important for, to be presented that when people are obedient... They're obedient to Jesus, not to people, not to a bunch of church rules, not to a creed. Oh, I better be obedient because the pastor is here. Or, the, or you know, some, some uh, powerful person is coming, so I, I need to behave in front of them. Or I'm going to church and people will see me, so I behave. Are we doing it for the church or are we doing it for Jesus? Is Jesus really the first, the last and best in everything? Christ must do this. It's very easy to fall when you have a church and you have a standard that comes from God's word that people come in and see, oh, everyone's doing this standard, so I better do it too. What's the motive, motive behind it? Is it doing it because other people are doing it? Or are you doing it because you know that's what Jesus has asked you to do? 
when you understand that principle, you're doing it to who? Jesus. And if everybody died, you'd still do it because it was to Jesus, not to other people. This makes a strong follower of Jesus Christ. And this is what the lesson is really bringing our attention as, as we close this, this whole quarter, this a half of year. This is the last lesson in the book. And this is a powerful lesson to bring back to our attention. It's about my relationship with Jesus and how he is to relate with everyone around me and how I should treat people, even my enemies. And so to finish with, I just want to bring out this personal uh, statement in the personal study. It should be the burden of every messenger to set forth the fullness of Christ. When the free gift of Christ's righteousness is not presented, the discourses are dry and spiritless. The sheep and lambs are not fed. Said Paul, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. There is marrow and fatness in the gospel. Jesus is the living center of everything. Put Christ into every sermon. Let the preciousness, mercy and glory of Jesus Christ be dwelt upon until Christ is formed within the hope of glory. I pray that you can focus on the Lord and in all your activities, whether it's in the church, spiritual, whether it's your education or your relationships with those around you, your family, friends or enemies, or even in your career, your work, that you will serve Jesus Christ as your personal saviour. This is my prayer that he can be first and last and best in everything. Thank you for watching. God bless you.